What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up. Anthony Sanfilippo's here. I'm Bob Weichel. Phillies are rolling, Anthony. They are rolling. They've won 13 of the last 15 games, a 6-1 and one road trip, a three-game a three sweep of a dreadful Oakland A's team. Phillies right now, you look up and you got a team that's four games over 500. Not at 500, not on the cusp of 500, not a game over, but four games over. This team's like, I feel like they're on a 100-win pace right now, dude. Well, Bob, this is the Phillies that we thought we were going to get all along, right? And and it's a good thing. I mean, look, yes, part of this 13-2 and two run has included a couple wins against Washington, three <laughs> wins against Oakland, three wins against Detroit. Yes, eight. So eight of the 13 wins have been against absolutely awful baseball teams. And, and don't forget about two wins against a bad Dodgers team, too. Because yeah, well, we're apparently gonna... the Dodgers stink, and we can get yeah, to that later. We can get to that, too, right? <laughs> But yeah, I mean, you know, so this is what you're supposed to do. And this is what they did last year is they when you have a bad team on your schedule, you beat them up. And then if you go, if you beat up the bad, we've said this, I don't know how many times, beat up the bad, beat up the bad teams, play 500 against the good teams. And you're you're a 90 win team and you're in the playoffs. And it's not even a question. So that's really what, you know what they weren't doing in the first two months of the season, well, really mostly just May. I mean, they were above 500 at the end of April. So mostly just May. Um, and, and now that they're, now they're doing it and they're making up with it in spades. I mean, yes, this is a good run that they're on, but the funny thing is, Bob, they've, they're, they've won 13 out of 15 and gained zero ground in the, in the division. Yeah. Cause the Braves have also won 13 out of 15. <laughs> if you rewind two weeks ago and we're talking about, Hey, here come the Phillies. They're going to win 13 out of 15 games. They're going to have a six and one road trip. They're going to play really good baseball. And then you look at the schedule and say, Oh wow. They're going to do that ahead of the Atlanta series. Yeah. They really have an opportunity to jump back into this thing. They'll cut it down to four or five games. Maybe they win the series. All of a sudden you're talking division again, but Atlanta has been unbelievable. They're eight and two in their last 10. They've won 13 out of 15. They just dropped 40 runs in four games against the Colorado Rockies. And I know that that is not a very good pitching staff, but 40 runs in four games. I mean, they're on fire right now, so that does set up quite a series at Citizen and, Bank Park this week. And not only that, the Marlins have won 12 out of 15, so they've only gained one game on the Marlins during this whole time. Uh, so you know, the Marlins are 10 games over 500 for the first time since 2011, wow. uh, which is a wild thing. I mean, you want to talk about a team that's been beating up on bad teams. It's the Marlins. They're 12-3, yeah. and three, and two of those three losses were against Seattle, who was the only half-decent team that they played. Um, so, yes, they have beat the hell out of some bad teams. The Marlins, but you, hey, that's again, that's what you're supposed to do, and that's what makes that's what puts the Marlins in a good spot. If you look at their calendar, August is their brutal month. They have an absolutely brutal month. Phillies are part of that uh, run that they have to play, but it's it's good team after good team after good team after good team. But if they give themselves enough of a cushion, even if they do fall back and have a bad month in August, they're still in the race come September. So the Marlins are a team that are, that's going to be there, and it looks like that they're going to be part of this this playoff mix uh, as far as going for it um so the Phillies really didn't gain ground on either of those teams but they're they've done enough separation um with other teams in, in baseball that they are now just a game out of the wild card spot and 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 I know you don't really like talking wild card in June but they're only a game out of that spot which goes to show you that as the more that they play like this the likelihood that they're going to be in a more comfortable position come September than they were maybe even a year ago uh is a is a more likely scenario you're all right. And you look at the landscape of the National League, we'll call it the playoff picture, the current wild card picture. And it truly is remarkable. I mean, you're talking about some of these teams that with the Phillies have gone on a run. And here you are now, you're talking about the Cincinnati Reds, who had a great extra inning win uh, against the Astros to wrap up their series. I mean, they've won. They've won eight straight games of Cincinnati Reds. I mean, they've been unbelievable. And certainly they've had an infusion of young talent there. They're playing with a totally different vibe and energy right now. I don't know about what their long-term sustainability is, but they're in it. San Diego has sort of gotten off the mat with the Phillies as well. They're 7-3 and three in their last 10 games. But what you're starting to see now, Miami has done enough, I think, to keep themselves in it for the duration the the Giants, I don't know if the Giants are a good team or not. I've, I've tried to discount them, but I'm not going to overlook the fact that they just took it to the Dodgers for three straight games this weekend, pummeled them, just absolutely pummeled them on Saturday night, 15 nothing. and you look up, run differential, plus 48. You know, like, they're 8-2 and two in their last 10 games. So San Francisco, 
I think is a team that I still long term don't look at and say, do, do I think that the Phillies are better than the Giants? I do. I also know that the Giants roughed up the Phillies earlier this season as well. I, I will acknowledge that. But I don't I don't think I, I fear them. But I also think that the Giants have now put themselves in this thing for the duration as well. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, they they just lost their best pitcher for – you got one on the IL um, for an oblique strain, which same thing Sir Anthony Dominguez has, right? So he's on, an, on the IL with an oblique. Um, but those those injuries are not easy to come back from, and sure. especially for pitchers, right? I mean, that's a – that's a tough muscle injury there. Um, so, I mean, it's not an arm injury. So, you, you know, once the once they feel like the muscle's healed, he'll be back. He'll be okay. But you're probably looking at uh, six weeks yeah. at least, right? And without your best pitcher, well, so that kind of knocks that, that kind that of. That NL West in. is is really interesting because you have those top four teams between Arizona, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And, and I would San still, Diego, yeah. and, and San Diego being there now as well. But those top three teams are bunched within four games of one another. And then the Padres are kind of in that next tier game below 500, still sort of lurking in the distance. So I think that those teams beat up on each other enough where it sort of clears the path. And the other thing that you're seeing, and I know we typically talk about the, the field a little bit later in the show, but it is just a truly fascinating picture of the National League right now. You're starting to see the the Pirates of the world sort of fall off a little bit. The Mets have just been a disgrace, five games under, and and the Cubs. It's they're the one team that's actually kind of interesting because when you look at Steele and Stroman at the top of the, the rotation, they have some some okay bats. Like they're a team in the Central that when it's all said and done, like I wouldn't be surprised if the Cubs end up in that thing. One because the division isn't particularly good, but like you kind of look at it and say, well, there's a strength there. And I thought that they played Baltimore. I had an opportunity, had quite a bit of downtime this weekend. I had an opportunity to watch the Cubs play the Orioles uh, for, for the bulk of the weekend. And, you know, you're looking at it, you're like, they're, they're running with a team that was 17 games over 500. So I, I, I'm real curious to see how that all shakes out. One thing I want to talk about before we get to the Phillies, you know, the point of this actual podcast, <laughs> the the, the New York Mets are on the brink here, and it's been a, a tough two years for the Phillies as it relates to the Mets head-to-head, but the Mets go down now and play the Astros for three games. A team, a Houston team that's still very good. I know they've dealt with some issues this year, but they just got roughed up this past weekend. So now you have a, a pissed-off Astros team, and then you have the Phillies at Citizens Bank Park. If the Mets go one and five this week, they're going to be nine games under. It's over. Oh, yeah. I mean, the Phillies can knock. I'm going to assume the Astros win the series against the Mets this week. I'm just, if I were a betting man, the Phillies could deliver a knockout blow to the Mets this weekend. They could. And it would be a blast if they did. It would be a lot of fun if they did. Uh, the only thing that I, my only concern with the Astros right now is that lineup th- does not look nearly as good mm-hmm. without Alvarez in the lineup, right? You're mm-hmm. Alvarez is hurt and. And then, boy, do they does he make a difference for that team? So, um, so yeah. I mean, look, I, I agree. I still would. I would still pick Houston two out of three in that series. The, Houston's pitching is still su- far superior to the Mets. Um, but yeah, I do think that there's a little bit of a chance for the Mets to maybe pull off a, a surprise and win two out of three there too. But I, I would still side with Houston. But yeah, so you right. look at this week. Away. You look at this week that the Phillies just had a six and one road trip. We're talking a week ago. What would be a good road trip? I said four out of, you know, four out of seven. You know, you just have a winning road trip. Get back to 500 yep. and, and take your chances with this Braves Mets six game little, you know, I would say it's a big week for the Phillies coming up. And then they get three out of four and you start to think to yourself or they get three out of four against the Diamondbacks. You start to think to yourself, okay. Even if they don't sweep Oakland, five and two, really solid, truly solid week here. And then what do they do? They go out and they they don't, I don't think, played well. I mean, they got good starting pitching this week, but I didn't think the Phillies had a particularly great weekend in Oakland, but they just took advantage of a dreadful team. And so as the Phillies sort of cooled off and came back to earth offensively, it was still enough to outlast that, that drag. So I, I got to say, like, what the Phillies have done – I don't know what it means for October. I know we just talked a little bit about the standings, but you know what I feel like they've done? They've injected that that belief, like that excitement. Like when you sit down on Tuesday night and watch game one, Phillies Braves, 
You're not talking about an underwhelming, underachieving team, team that's three games under. You're, you're talking about a, a good team, a team that's playing really good baseball right now and that you should be excited about. And if 40,000 people show up, they're going not to, to honor what happened last year, but to watch a good team this year now. They've, they've changed the entire feel of the season in two weeks. They, they really have. Um, and, and the one thing that I think is kind of, you know, we, we, it may be a little overlooked, Bob, and it, it's this. They've, we, we've seen them have their big breakout offensive games, right? We've seen them have the big games where they put up 15 runs in a game or whatever. We've seen the dominant pitching performances. We've seen the bullpen, you know, games where the bullpen actually pitches really well, even if a starter fails and then they come in and hold the line and you come out of your big comebacks, right? The Phillies have had, what, five walk-off wins this year. We've seen all those games. The thing that we didn't really see until this weekend, in my mind, was Phillies winning ugly. There, there were games against the A's where you sat there and said, this is usually, this season, this has usually been a loss. Mm -hmm. They found ways to lose these games. And against the A's, of course, it could be because they're playing the worst team in baseball. But at the same time, that, is, that A's team has been playing better. I mean, they've, they've been grinding against teams, and they've been hanging in game. They've not been, they're not getting blown out. They had a seven-game winning streak, and then they've been, been hanging in with some teams. So they have been playing better. But those are the games that those the, the Phillies would would lose earlier this year, and I'm particularly talking about Saturday's game, which yeah. was the 12 inning game. Right, that one was one where you sat there and go, "Yeah, this is a game that they would have lost," and they found a way to win it, even though it was really, really bad baseball. And then even yesterday, where they were struggling to hit. I mean, you had Schwarber and 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 Pache, the only people hitting in the game, um, and yet they were able to get the job done in a game where you know. Oakland kept hanging around and hanging around and hanging around, and you were like, they're, they're going to blow this, aren't they? They're going to find a yeah. way to cough this up, and they didn't. And so, so like to me, that was that's what tells you that they're really, really back, right? It's not just winning the games and beating these teams and going winning 13 out of 15. It's the fact that they've now shown you that they can win all different styles. And the one that the, the one that was not that we had not seen yet was winning ugly, and they won ugly a couple times this weekend. I give them I give them credit, and I'll give Zach Wheeler especially some credit yesterday. You know, that lineup that they put out there was essentially it was a punt lineup. It was we got our guy going, that's probably gonna be enough. Harper's down, and although Harper against the lefty right now, you know, okay, I don't know how uh, huge of an impact him not being in a lineup against the lefty is at the moment. But Castellanos down a second consecutive day. You kind of just go, not that they weren't trying to win the game, not that they weren't trying to field a, a competitive product, but that was not an all-in lineup. Uh, there's right. no arguing that. So to be able to win that type of game on a getaway day, like where, where you're coming back east, you've had a really good road trip, That's a it's a letdown spot. Even with Wheeler sure. on the mound, it's an easy letdown spot. And that's the thing that, that I like to see yesterday is that Schwarber's the one – one of the difference makers in the lineup and he wastes no time. It's like, we're not going to do this today. We're not going to, we're not going to roll over. We're not going to blow this game. We're not going to say, well, we could have gone six and one instead. It's five and two. It's boom. Third lead off Homer of the, of the road trip. Right. Right. I mean, he just set the tone and that was enough. And you had a feeling like that, that might be enough to stand up. You know, just that one run was going to hold up. Now that didn't, quite turn out that way but I look at this game yesterday and it's all about Zach Wheeler because he gets through five innings and he's I, I would say he was not vintage Zach Wheeler yesterday he certainly did not have his his best stuff right he struggled a little bit with command he was having problems with the home plate umpire to left-handed batters he wasn't getting the inner part of the plate you saw that exchange that they had had uh, I think it was after the fourth inning he'd thrown a ton of pitches and you say to yourself okay yeah, he throws five clean, but that's it. You're only giving me five innings against the A's on a day when you knew that the bullpen was going to be a little bit short after playing the extra inning game on Saturday. And I'll tell you what, they put him back out there in the sixth inning and he goes out and uh, he it's one, two, three, he gets a double play. So he faces the minimum in the sixth and comes back out, he comes out at 99 and he leaves the game at 107. That extra inning that he pitched, giving him that sixth inning, I actually think won them that game yesterday. I think the Phillies were one more inning from that bullpen away from losing that game. So his ability to extend to the sixth, I thought was actually the difference. Yeah, I, I wonder if uh, 
if Strom would have gone two. Because they were so shorthanded in the bullpen. I mean, Thompson talks about it after the game and says, you know, Soto was down, Kimbrell was down, and uh, and Vasquez was down. So you were down three pitchers in the bullpen. Mm-hmm. I mean, you're likely – I mean, I guess Hoffman was available, possibly. I mean, I guess if you needed one more guy and then you have Covey for the multi-inning situation, if <laughs> absolutely necessary, you can break glass in case of emergency, right? Um but I mean, that's kind of that's kind of where they were. So yes, if if Wheeler couldn't have that quick sixth, I'm guessing Strom's going to. And so I'm not trying to be funny here, I'm, and I'm not trying to be a dick. I'm just going to reiterate what I said. If Zach Wheeler doesn't go six innings, yeah. they don't win the game yesterday. I think probably another not. inning of, of June Nat Strom right now probably gives you a different result. And to that point, uh, I have a lot of positive things I want to talk about, but of course you find a way to get me on this. Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to give you some 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 quick numbers here. It's an innate uh, ability that I have, Bob. <laughs> here's Matt Strom ERA by by month, and I'll exclude his one appearance in March. Uh, yeah. 224 in April, 450 in May, 784 in, in June. Um, opponents hit 154 against him in April when we were like, yo, this guy's been a godsend, and yeah. where would they be without Matt Strom? And, and listen, he's made contributions to this team. I, I think he's been a net positive. Yes. Uh, in, in fairness. But the last two months, uh, posing hitters at 296 against him in the month of May, they're hitting 282 against him in June. He's given up four home runs already in the month of June. Uh, I suspect this is about workload and pushing him beyond uh, what he's he's done in terms of output and, and innings pitch the last couple of years. Yeah. I think we're just seeing a guy that's that's kind of going through a, a spot right now with some fatigue. But uh, I'm, I'm holding my breath when Matt Strom's in games right now, man. Yeah, I, I am a little bit too, Bob. I mean, I you know, I, I resisted uh, tweeting about it yesterday when he gave up the home run because it, it, he's a guy that, that yes, you, you don't want to you don't want to completely criticize him because of the con- positive contributions he's made. And look, if you go pitchers are going to give up solo homers. That means you're throwing strikes, right? I mean, look, it happens, okay? And that's the, it's not the end of the world when you give up a solo homer, but. If you're a reliever and you're coming in to games to lock down a game, right? Yeah. You're you you don't want to be giving up runs at all, period. And he's done it. I think three of those four homers have come in games where he's been the re- in relief. I think yeah. the one was when he was a, uh, an opener, but the other three were were in relief. And that's a little bit concerning. Is that you know you're yes he's throwing strikes, he's not walking guys. That's good but you can't be putting those pitches right over the plate for guys to put out of the ballpark and cut into the and cut into the lead that you're trying to protect. I mean that's that's where the concern is with Matt Strom right now. And I yeah, he's a guy that could probably use a a timeout. <laughs> and that doesn't necessarily mean you know let's send send him down. No, no, right. no, no, no. I'm not saying that, but maybe you give Matt Strom 4 or 5 days off, you know, just like We'll, we'll get through without you for a couple of I days. suspect that you're seeing the impact of his, not just in terms of the workload, but the way he's been used. It's your starter. Now we're coming back to the bullpen. Now, wait, we're going to use you as, as an opener yeah. again. And, and now, wait, now we're going to have you try to hold a lead in the seventh. I just think that that lack of consistency paired up with the actual pure amount of, of pitches that he's thrown at this point in the season. I think he's just kind of going through it. I'm not in the business of making excuses for guys, but I think you have to acknowledge the reality of, of the way that he's been deployed here and kind of the lack of consistency in it. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind that it is having an impact on his results right now. For sure. For sure. It, it really is. And I do think that he's a guy that will, you know, He'll be back to what he was earlier. Maybe not that good, but he'll be back to being a much more reliable player once he kind of gets a little bit of a reset. A little bit of a reset. I don't think he needs that, you know, two weeks that they get sent down to the minors for reset. Let Connor Brogdon's getting right. Like I, I don't think it's that, but I do think it's a situation where it's like let's be a little bit more judicious when we're using Matt Strom for the next couple weeks. Then you get into the All Star break and you say, okay, come out of the All Star break, and I think Matt Strom is is more like the pitcher you saw early in the season and not not what you've seen the last four or four or five outings. I don't think that five years from now we're all going to remember the, the Oakland A's series that just transpired this past weekend, but I do want to just kind of run through a, a couple things. I, I, I suppose some of the highlights of the weekend. 
go into Saturday and we keep talking about this fifth starter issue and they got four really good innings from Christopher Sanchez and it mm-hmm. may have been five had he not been hit in the hand and kind of had some swelling and they said, you know, hey, it looks fine. He should make his next start. But what a job by him. And I think there's a couple things that go into it. Number one, he was ahead of hitters, especially early on in the game. He did run into some trouble in the fourth inning, made some really big pitches when it looked like it might get away from him in a game where the Phillies were not hitting. So it wasn't even like, hey, man, come up. We're going to get you five runs real early. Just get us through four or five innings. Give us something that, that resembles a professional effort. It was no margin for error. And he made he, he made some really big pitches in that fourth inning to get through it. I was impressed, and and I think there are multiple things. One, kudos to him, but also credit credit whatever happens down in Lehigh, and and credit whatever happened over the last month in the work that they've done with him. Because I I know we've seen him come up and be competitive and and do an okay job in spots, and I'm not saying that all of a sudden he's locked down this fifth starter job for the remainder of the year. Not let's not get ahead of ourselves, but for for one game he was prepared and looked good and he executed and it was impressive. Yeah, and he even got himself out of that jam. Uh, was that the fourth inning? I think yeah. it was when he, you know, they had bases loaded. I think it mm-hmm. was what the situation was, and he got out of it. So, um, and that was even after getting hit by the pitch uh, or hit by the line drive. Um, yeah, no, it's good. And and Bob, I don't know if you got a chance to to read that opus that I did last week uh, in, prior to the Oakland series, where I talked about the Phillies' pitching situation maybe isn't the the thing that they need the most right now and and that you know when you get to the trade deadline you should be looking uh for hitters first and then pitchers second um it was interesting because i i I looked at it and i saw there were only five chances for the for that quote-unquote bullpen game or fifth starter spot to come up between now and august 1st only five Mm -hmm. and one of them was one now now down to four because one of them was that christopher sanchez start and they won the game so uh yes it was important for sanchez to have that kind of outing and and that's the thing like you can you can get by with these odd starts now the phillies are slightly going off a different schedule than what i had what i had written they had decided they wanted to give nola wheeler suarez and and uh, walker an extra day off so they are going to have the fifth starter go here during the Mets series instead of skipping it. They could have skipped it and had everybody pitch on normal rest. Um, But so they are going to have one more in June. So it's actually, there is still the potential for five spots, but we will see what happens because there is a double header that's built in there. We'll see how they play that double header with the Padres uh, right after the all-star break. So um, yeah, but ultimately I'm, I'm kind of talking in circles a little bit here, but the point is, is that, it's not as dire a need as I think a lot of people are making it out to be. Yes, it's important that you have you don't want to tax your bullpen. The more important thing is having somebody who can give you bulk innings, but it's less important that it's a that it's a really good pitcher. If, if you follow along with, with what right. I'm saying, you just got to make sure that the bullpen's not overtaxed. But you can get away with a Christopher Sanchez for a couple of starts or th- you know, three starts if need be um, until until somebody else from the minor leagues is ready. And then go to one of the prospect kids maybe. Or, you know, Noah Song's got to make the roster at some point, right? Maybe he could give you one or two of these. And then maybe Painter's ready sometime in August, and he can give you a few then. So the, it, it makes it less important to say, oh, they need to go out and trade for a starting pitcher when, in fact, the starting pitcher that they would go out and get if they are to go get, go get one is more likely going to be of that Noah Syndergaard variety a year ago than it is going to be a top of the rotation kind of guy. I'm almost of the mindset, and and I know we talked about this at length on Friday in our previous show, and I, I don't want to do a disservice to our listeners and just have the same conversation four days later, but yeah, I, I, I will say I'm almost of the mindset if if that's what they're going to do, then and, and maybe I'll come to regret these comments, but then let's take our chances with the song Sanchez and Painter Wild Card. I don't I don't need Noah Syndergaard here again, you know, or that type of player right. to plug the spot. I'm almost of the mindset if you're going to do it, if you're going to trade for a starting pitcher, and I, I I'll say this a little bit more forcefully than I, I did a few days ago, then I it, it better be somebody that you could say, Do I want to start Aaron Nola in game two or do I want to start this guy? Like to me, like either bring in a difference maker and then you can use Ranger Suarez in that Swiss Army knife role that you kind of did last postseason. Like to me, 
I don't need a stopgap fifth starter beyond what they already have in the organization. Get a difference maker or don't. And I understand that the cost of doing business, especially in this current field, like this ties into what we talked about at the beginning of the show. I have no idea. And granted, things can change very quickly in seven days. There can be injuries. There can be six game losing streaks. So let alone six days versus four or five more weeks. I'm sure that the whole field and playoff picture will look much different. But right now, it's very hard to say, hey, th- these teams are going to be sellers. I mean, there's probably five teams in baseball right now that are that are straight up absolutely in a position to sell. And if we don't get any more clarity here in the next month, month plus, I don't know how the hell you do a trade. Like, it, we're not going to have 12, 13 teams saying, hey, we have a, an expiring contract that's ready to be offloaded here. It, it's not that simple right now. Right. And especially – Especially with pitchers. I mean, that even more so. I mean, you might find a few position players that maybe are, are intriguing, but there's so few pitchers. It's every team needs pitching. Every team needs pitching. I, I've heard multiple radio personalities and, and a columnist recently in the last 10 days say, like, it's a joke. It's a joke. They need like they need to do it now. What are they waiting for? And I'm like, do, do we not understand how this works? Yeah. <laughs> What do you mean they need to do it right now like yeah sure in a perfect world if you were just the phillies and you could just do whatever the hell you wanted at all times yes of course like let's make a trade let's um, while we're at it why don't we why don't we get paul goldschmidt right now let's let's bring him in you know yeah it, it just doesn't work that way and so i i will defend them on that front um but it's going to be really because i do i hear you and i get your point about the the, the that spot in the rotation maybe not being as big of a deal as, as we've made it out to be, and it might not be the pressing concern that, that needs to be fixed immediately. I, I just don't know. Like I, I'm all about pitching. I'm about difference-making pitching, though. I'm not about stopgap. And I, I will say, and I think this is a good segue into what has happened this month. We, we've talked about the lineup being erratic, and, and to some extent it still is, uh, especially after this weekend. If, if they lost one of those games – if they lost on Saturday and then they came back and eked by yesterday, I don't I don't think we would be as like all as well. We'd be like, what the hell with this lineup again? I'm just going to say this. Philly starting pitching, and I'm not going to just cherry pick this month. And I'll get to this month in a second. But overall now, like because we've talked about how bad this rotation's been and inconsistent, 13th in ERA across the entire sport. This is not just National League. Sixth in whip, ninth in batting average against, third best strikeout to walk ratio and they lead fan graphs war that, like that's for the season yeah it's it's like their june has been so good that they've actually brought a lot of their key metrics into the front half of the league so like they're getting average to slightly above average starting pitching in a lot of different in a lot of different ways right now and then june has been otherworldly era 254 it's first in baseball um, 0.97 whip is first in baseball. Uh, 193 batting average against is first. Home runs per nine, 0.47 is first. Uh, strikeout to walk is fourth. I mean, like they're they've been elite for for two and a half weeks here. And to think about to think that Nola and Strom are giving up those home runs, and yet they're still amongst you know better than everybody else in baseball, right? Um, and like I said, Strom. It, I think at least one might be two of his home runs this month. I got to th- I got to go back and look, but I think it's a, I know for one for sure came in a, in an in an opener role, so that counts as a starting pitcher, right? In, in yeah. what you're doing, you're not just looking at the top four guys, right? You're looking no, at yeah, this anybody is who's all started, anybody right? that started a game, yeah, yeah. So I mean, so that's what I'm saying. Like even those guys giving up the home runs that they've given up, they're still the best in baseball yeah. this month against uh, home runs against. Look, this is why you know when you looked, it was funny. We were sitting at. Um, Yesterday, I was uh, sitting out for part of the day. I was sitting out at a bar with uh, with my son and some friends, and we were uh, having a few drinks and watching some uh, early baseball. And th- there was uh, one channel on at the bar that had like betting lines up, and it had betting lines up for uh, to win each league, um, National League, American League, and then win the World Series. And the Phillies were eleven to one to win the National League, which I think is pretty good odds. Right? I mean, it's eleven to one is pretty good. Um, they were, I think it was either third, tied for third best or fourth or just fourth best. I forget what it was. Um, 
I know the Braves and the Dodgers were ahead of them. I, Padres might have been the same. I just don't remember if they were. Uh, and then for the World Series, what I thought was a is a good bet is thirty to one right now. You can get the Phillies at thirty to one, but they're amongst the leaders. And the reason is Bob is because the starting pitching has come around and the bullpen is so good. The Phillies have pitching. And you may not, you know, we, we've we complained about it. It's funny because it's it's been a sticking point for the start of the season, and rightfully so. I'm not, I'm not saying that we were wrong in saying that we should have been complaining about it. We absolutely should have been. In the moment, it was not good enough. But it has stabilized and gotten to a point now where you say, this is what they thought it was going to be. This is what right. we thought it was going to be. And... Now the expectation going forward is this is how these guys are going to pitch. And if this is how these guys are going to pitch, they're really good. The Phillies are really good. And and so that's why, you know, that, like this upcoming you know week is going to be very telltale in a lot of ways. But at the same time, going forward, and because it is June, there's still three, two and a half months that you got to get through. And then, you know, then the big games come up to happen. Um even though that's the case, you, you got to assume that once they figured it out, they're going to be able to keep it going. Right. I mean, we've seen, we've seen these guys go on extended stretches in the past. It's not like, it's like, Oh, well let's cross our fingers and hope Think about where we are today by pitcher. You have Zach Wheeler. You feel like he's back. He is Zach Wheeler. And, and even when he doesn't have his plus stuff, like he, you know, he didn't have it yesterday, but he was he's still really good. Yeah. You, Look at Aaron Nola, who you're like, you know, he does some things that are good. I know he's struggling a little bit, but overall, he's, he's all right. Ranger Suarez has been awesome this month. Tywon Walker in the month of June, 150 ERA, 24 innings pitched in four starts, 157 batting average against 488 OPS opposing hitters, 0.88 whip. He's been sensational. Yeah. And, and so now you're talking about Walker being awesome, Suarez being awesome. Wheeler being awesome. And then Nola, you know, you could make an argument. He's like their third best guy right now. And you still feel okay about that. But think about where we were three weeks ago. We're like, well, Zach Wheeler hasn't been Zach Wheeler this year. We think we'll be all right. Aaron Nola hasn't been Aaron Nola this year. We think we'll be all right. Ranger Suarez has been a disaster the first three, four times he's picked up a ball. And Tywin Walker looks like a bust. And they don't have a fifth starter. So they're screwed. So, you know, I'm I'm also willing to say it's possible that three weeks from now we don't feel quite as good as we do this morning about it as well. I mean, sure, they, sure. they've had Things the benefit. Change. I'm and I'm not I'm not trying to diminish anything that they've done. And that Arizona series against a very good offense in a place that they don't play well, they got some really quality starts from that pitching staff. So I mean that you have to account for that. They threw the ball well against Los Angeles and we can talk about that being a top heavy lineup, but look at the numbers. Los Angeles has a good lineup. So it's not like they're, they're doing this all against bottom feeders either. I think this is real in other words, but they've, they've, they have taken advantage of a favorable stretch to some extent as well. Um, I, I just think that, as you said, though, that this is a strength of the team, uh, and I think it's going to only highlight the strength that is the bullpen. So this, I think there is a reasonable belief that this can continue to some to some extent. And speaking about bullpen strengths, Bob, I mean, obviously we know who we've talked ad nauseum about the four guys at the back, I, even though Dominguez is on the IL now with that oblique. Did uh, Have you been seeing what they've what they saw in spring training? With Junior Marte, I mean, I I thought his perform- I mean, look. You come in for your first major league save, and I know it's the Oakland A's, and um, you know, but the the nerves have to be still pretty high. And dude came in and just blew away three batters, even though it's the A's. And and I I, I almost think that what you've seen in I think it's ten of his last eleven appearances has been sh- filthy. And like you sit there and go, yeah, maybe this guy's also part of that that five man makes it a five man yeah. bullpen in the back end. Yep. And and what a weird week for him, right? I mean, like yeah. you pitch in Arizona, it doesn't go well. He's been optioned, he's back up, he's and and then here he is getting a save in the ninth inning. I mean, they like him. They they like they they truly do like him, and it's it's not hard to see why. You're talking yeah. about 98, 99 boss, ton of sink. And I thought yesterday, did you did you watch the game in real time yesterday? Yes, yes I did. So the he's rolling along and then the pitch com goes, right? Yeah. And I get here we go. 
you know, this is going to break the rhythm. Now he's going to, now he's going to walk two guys. There's yeah. going to be a flare in the right. I'm still so conditioned and programmed like to, to expect that. But uh, I mean, he gets back, he makes his pitches and he was really good. And I mean, they, you, you talk about these, these top guys in the bullpen, Alvarado, Dominguez, Kimbrel, Soto. I, I I think that that is certainly a strength, and and it's funny. You like you look at Soto's ERA and you go, eh. You look at Kimbrel's ERA, you go, eh. But like these guys are good. Yeah. And then it's that that like that that second wave. Like even guys like you know Vasquez, uh, guys like Hoffman. Like these aren't not that I want them pitching key outs in the eighth inning every night, Marte included. But they're still intriguing. Like they're still hot. There's some upside to these guys. Yeah. Like, you remember like the, these Phillies bullpens four years ago where they, <laughs> they'd have dudes coming out throwing 92 and like, you're like, like these are all plus arms that have stuff. Like the, if, if they're on, they can get key outs. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No. And I, and I think that that's, I think that that's the, the difference with this team, Bob, right now, because I think even if, it's why you said three weeks from now, maybe we're not as excited about the starters as we are right this morning. And you might be right. But even if that's the case, even if your starters are hitting that struggle point again, the bullpen to me is just so good that they can cover mistakes of the starters. Yeah. And I think that that's when you when you look at where they were, the fact that they were kind of, even though they were not, performing to the level that we wanted them to perform and they were you know under 500 and playing not playing great baseball the reason that they were still able to hang around and be in the position that they were to get to where they are now it has was because of that bullpen bullpen, they weren't blowing they weren't blowing leads they weren't blowing winnable games hey we're up four two in the eighth we lost we were up five three in the ninth we we talked about that they weren't when they they weren't having that many opportunities but when they got them they were holding them yeah, and so that's like to me. That's why I, I don't. I, I'm bullish still because even if the pitchers, the starting pitchers, tail off a little bit, and they're they're going to regress back to the norm. They're not going to pitch at a two three ERA, you know, for the next three months. We all know that. But even if they regress back a little bit, I'm confident enough in the bullpen as a whole to be able to pick up the the slack when they struggle a little bit. I just think that that's what makes this team so intriguing to me uh, is, is that is the bullpen more than anything else. Let's look ahead. Yeah, let's look ahead. They, they've, they've had a, a great month of June to this point. They have, as I said earlier, they've changed the entire feel of the season. I, I think that people are energized by what has happened here the last couple of weeks. Cause it was just so disappointing. It was yeah. so disappointing. I mean, what do we say? It was, we really doing this again? Are we really going to spend three and a half months talking about the fight to be 500? So now they have the Braves coming in. And we said in the top of the show here that Braves have won 13 out of their last 15 as well. They still hold an eight game lead over the Phillies. We've noted several times over the last couple months that this is the team to beat in this division. They're probably the team to beat in the national league. They have flexed their muscles <laughs> quite quite a bit this past weekend against Colorado. Michael Harris, who, who was having a dismal season is red hot. Suddenly like they have no, no weakness in that lineup right now. So I guess there's two ways to look at this. Do you think that the Phillies can get back into the division race in in earnest like can they really make this a thing or can we sit here and say look the Phillies might win 90 games they might be a really good team but they just are not going to run with the Atlanta Braves over the next three and a half months it's not gonna happen it's gonna be tough to to, let's be honest it's gonna be tough you go 13 and 2 and and gain zero ground yeah I mean that's I mean what what more could you ask for the Phillies, right? Yeah, last- it felt like this was their opening. Like it maybe Atlanta goes seven and eight, the Phillies go thirteen and and two, maybe they gain four or five games and they're three, four out right now. It, yeah. to, to do this and be eight out is is pretty sobering, at least in how it relates to division expectations. Yeah, I mean, look, is it still possible? Certainly it is. I mean, it's certainly still possible. I mean, you got a lot of games left against the Braves. Um but like you know, if I say to you, Bob, we're we're happy if they win two out of three, right? 
mm-hmm. this this week. Well, that only gets you to within seven. Seven, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So if they had gotten it to, if they again, it, the Braves didn't even have to go 500 in the, the if if the Braves had just gone 10 and five, which was 667. The Phillies would be five games out right now going into this series. And then all of a sudden you say, well, you win two out of three, then you're only four out. And that's a race, right? And so that's the the fact that the Braves were that good while you were that good is is the hard thing. And and yeah, I look, I don't think that make it's going to be easy to make up eight games against that team. I just don't see the Braves having a weakness enough to to drop off enough for you to catch them. Um <clears throat> But it's it still remains possible. I mean, let's after I, I think we'll have a better feel come Friday uh, of where things are. Because look, look, look I, I don't think they're going to sweep the Braves, but if they did, and now they're you know sixteen and two out of in the last eighteen games, that includes eight wins against the Braves, Diamondbacks, and Dodgers, who are the you know the, who were the three teams that everybody said are the three best teams in the National League. Well, guess what? <laughs> then all of a sudden, it's a different conversation. Um, I don't see a sweep by any stretch of the imagination. So. Well, they get they get Spencer Strider on. Uh, he's been bad lately, and he's been bad. I mean, he has struggled. Um, the strikeouts are there, yeah, but he's he's had some problems here, especially the last few times out. Braves are advanced line here. I know the game's not until Tuesday night. We're doing this Monday morning, but there is a there are odds out on that game, and and the Braves are a minus one forty favorite over Ranger Suarez and the and the Phillies. And the Phillies will also uh, have Nola and Walker going uh, in the uh, final two games of the series as well. But I mean, I would not be surprised. The Phillies with Nola on the mound on Wednesday night may be favored. Uh, and well, then Smith, El- you got Smith Schauver, I guess, going for Atlanta. Yeah. I think that there's enough of an unknown. I mean, I know he's been okay in a very small, you know, state yeah. with the Braves, but I would think you would probably get Nola as a favorite there. And then Elder, who's been really good. You've talked about him on the show and, and yeah. certainly Walker's maybe the national league pitcher of the month right now uh, on Thursday in the day game, which is probably a toss up. So it, to me, it is sort of a toss up series. One thing I would, I would say, Let's let's not do this. Like we will get on 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 Friday morning if the Phillies lose two out of three and and probably be agitated, and we'll probably pick some things apart because that's that's what we do. But like, can we can we make a pact here to to not get on Friday morning if they lose two out of three and go? Yeah, well, you, know, you see, you see yeah. that another playing they they're not playing the JV anymore. Like, let's not do that. Like, let's. Let's say, hey, they've they they've had a really good month. They lost two out of three to a really good team. I will tell you the certainly the result that I would be disappointed with would would be a sweep. If they yeah. if the Braves come in here and they just broom them and and just beat the shit out of them, and you know they're scoring nine runs a night. Philly's pitching doesn't hold up. Philly's offense is doing the can't hit with runners in scoring position thing. Like that'll upset me. Yeah, um, yeah. that would be a disappointing outcome. But as long as they kind of do what they did down in Atlanta, play competitive baseball. Show that you can you can run with this team. Yeah, like are you going to win the NL East? No. Come October, though, we're not going to be intimidated by you, right? And, and I think that that's what I want to see. Yeah, and I think that that's fair, Bob. I think that that's absolutely fair. Um, you know, I I don't I don't think that we'll I, I don't think regardless I don't think we're going to have that on that kind of show on Friday. So I think that uh, I think that you're safe. I think that we we can make that you know pinky swear and and be be on board with it and come Friday everything will be fine. But uh, well, I- but <laughs> I, because I, we said, well, let's look ahead. I'm sorry. I'm going to have a different tone when it comes to this weekend. With the Mets? The Mets, <laughs> the Mets stink. They, they do. They stink. And if, like, I don't want to do this thing, like, if, if we were better at promoting our show, this would be what we clip. It would be me saying the Mets stink and the Phillies should put them out of their misery this weekend. It would be a disgrace. To let the Mets come into Citizens Bank Park and those fans come down here and they load up the stadium with whatever it is. The, what is it called? The seven line or whatever yeah, the hell that line, yeah. group is like, don't let it happen this weekend. I need the fans out there. I need the Philly fans to be nasty, you know, in, in a legal way. I need the Phillies to like to show up and respond to that team. Don't let this happen again. You're better than the Mets. The team sucks. Bury them. I agree I with can, you. I can deal with the inconsistencies against a good Atlanta team. Do not lose a series to New York Mets this weekend. <laughs> Please. 
I agree with you, Bob. I agree with you. The, nothing drives me crazier when they lose. They got, they got swept by the Mets up in New York. And I was sitting there just rolling my eyes because I was like, they, the Phillies could have won every one of those games. Like the Mets didn't blow them out or anything like that. The Phillies could have won every one of those games and just played like shit in each of those games. And I'm and I would sit there with my eyes like I cannot believe that they're going to lose again to this crap team because yeah. I, the Mets. I've you know how I feel about that team for a long time now. I, and I just sit there and it just bothers me. And I agree with you. You cannot have that kind of series this weekend at home. Things are going so well. The city's a buzz. You know, there's buzz again in this city about the Phillies. It's going to be sold out. Six consecutive games are going to be sold out. Packed houses down there. You just yes, you want the Braves series to be competitive. Hopefully, you win two out of three. But even if you lose two out of three, you cannot go and lose that series to the Mets. That they have to win that. I don't know how the pitching lines up for the Mets. They will see. They will see Scherzer, and I believe they'll see Carrasco, who's just flat stinks. out stinks. Yeah, he's he's old. And you know what? Like, I'm sorry, Scherzer. Sure, Scherzer, like uh, yeah. it's over. It's over. Yeah, this is not this is not the Max Scherzer that you've been rolling your eyes at and and saying, oh god, we're seeing him again. You know how the Phillies went through? Th- it seemed like they saw Max Scherzer a hundred times a year the last number of years, and you go, oh, man, here we go again, Max Scherzer, not again. the same guy. Like he's yeah. just not. Yeah. So I, I I just I think point being, I don't care who they throw, like just beat them. I, I don't care what the I don't care if Sanchez go, just find a way to beat these guys this time, um, and, and it would be sweet to do it in that spot just for once and for all. Just be done with the Mets this year. <laughs> just, just get rid of the Mets. <laughs> I mean, they lost two out of three this weekend. St. Louis Cardinals who can't beat anybody. No, I know. I mean, I it's, they're, it's they're bad. so so bad. Yeah, uh, I think I, I think you're going to see Senga for sure. Uh, he okay. pitched well again. He he uh, lines up. I think he lines up to start the series. Okay. Uh, he pitched. He pitched well against the Phillies that the uh, game up in New York, if you remember. Oh uh, yeah, uh, the, the the ghost fork. Yeah, know, like, ghost fork. Exactly. But, hey guys, like you, you know what he's gonna do. Everyone knows what he's gonna do. Spit on it and then and then get him. I, I just, I, I just am so out, man. I'm so out on that team. I I'm, I hope the Phillies play well this week so that that like we can come in Friday and be a little bit pumped up about that this weekend. You know, I don't want to go limping into that series with the Mets. Yeah, I think it's. That's, I think it's. I that's think it's, my mindset right now. Yeah, I think it's Senga Carrasco Scherzer is what it's going to be. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, yeah. I know I'm putting I'm putting uh, aside my my big J journalist hat here. I know I'm, <laughs> I'm talking like a fan, but like, I I can sit up there and, and be as neutral and, and as professional as, as anyone. But you know when, when it comes to this, like if I'm being honest, like yeah, this this week has a little extra juice for me. Can, can we uh, shift to talk about a um, a topic that I know neither of us are ready to to make a firm stand behind one way or the other. But I do think is one worth keeping an eye on as this season progresses. And I'm not just saying this because he had a really good game yesterday or had a great game in the field the other night. But is, is, does Christian Pache intrigue you enough right now to sit there and say, if things keep going the way they're going – Maybe he ends up being getting a little bit more time than Brandon Marsh in center field. Okay. So let's, let's do this. I'm going to number you to death here a little bit. Okay. Christian Pache in his major league career is at 341 at bats. He's a 173 hitter with a 486 yep. OPS. Yep. However, he has a 929 OPS and 33 at bats. He's 11 for 33 with the Phillies. So it has been in a very, very brief amount of time, but Numbers aside, watch him play. You see some of the jumps that he gets on baseballs. And, and this is something we have not seen with Phillies outfielders. And, and I know that everyone acts like Brandon Marsh is a gold glove center fielder. He's, he's not. I'm, right. I'm sorry. He's okay. He's fine. But he's not a gold glove center fielder. He, you watch Pache and, and the jumps and reads that he gets on baseballs. And he makes difficult plays look routine. He makes almost... I don't want to oversell this, but balls that just straight up a lot of outfielders aren't going to get to, he gets to them. He He's a guy that's a difference maker defensively. He can save you runs. He can save you innings. He can save you pitches. Um, so for that reason alone, when you have 
Kyle Schwarber playing left field and Nick Castellanos playing right field to have a premium defensive player in center field is, is something that I'm intrigued by just for that reason. Then you add in this offense that we've gotten from him and you start to wonder like, yeah, is there a, a scenario where, where he does play more? And one other quick thing, cause I know that you're, this is your topic, but why was he not in right field? Oh my God. Why was he not in center field? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I agree. I, I, I agree with you. He, sh- he should be in center field. But I I think there's like some yes. uh, we'll call them political considerations. Is that yes. the right term? Yes, got to be okay. political about it. Yes, for sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, let, let, uh, let's t- I'll take that issue first. Like, I have zero understanding of it. And I- I'll be honest, I'm going to actually ask Thompson about it tomorrow. Like, I, I want to know. I want to know what the reasoning is. Why uh, not? Why he's not in center? I know. I know he can't give me. He's not going to give me an honest answer about why he's not in center and Marsh is in the corner. But I do want to know why it made more sense to play Pache and left and Harrison, who doesn't play right field, in yeah. right. You he know, does like, not that, play the outfield. Looked horrible on Saturday. And looked he's, horrible he's, yesterday. He's, yesterday and I, too. Like, yeah. I'm not going to even get mad at, at him for for that. It's, it's like, a position he doesn't play. He doesn't play there. Yeah. Right. You know why not give? Why not put Pache out there? I I don't yeah. understand it. So I will ask that question because that, I agree with you. That makes zero sense. Uh, but on the on the bigger question, I, Christian Pache doesn't need to hit 333 for me. He, or 3, whatever he is, 311, right. whatever it is. 11 for 33 is 333. Mm-hmm. He doesn't need to hit 333 for me. If Christian Pache hits 240, with his defense and his speed when he's on base and as well, uh, he's a good base runner, like – that matters so much more to me in this lineup. Mm-hmm. He could be a 240 hitter, bat ninth, and mean so much more to the Phillies than what Brandon Marsh is giving you. So to me, if if he if it plays out over the course of the next couple of months that he can at least give you that when he plays, he doesn't have to be a one or two start a week guy. Right. He could be a guy that plays more regularly. And and so the one thing we know, well, he's going to start against lefties. We know this, right? This is a thing that Marsh can hit lefties, Pache can, and Pache is going to hit against lefties. Okay, fine. That's okay. But you did see him get that second double last yesterday off of a right-hander. And it was a really flat swing, right? It was no, no uppercut, no swinging through. Like, he had a really good approach at the plate with that. And you could see that he's got some confidence in his game right now. Like he, like you could just see it on the person, like in the in the player. Well, he, what's impressed me is that he was going well. Then he lands on the injured list, and you go, okay, is that going to kind of extinguish derail it, whatever right? was going on? Right? Yeah. Oh, that was fun for five minutes. Then he comes back up, and he did not hit in the, that rehab stint. He was having some. Uh, the reports were that he was having decent at bats. I think his final game, he had a couple hits, and they're like, "All right." Then he comes back up, and he's he's been good again. And it, yeah. You know, had a good weekend, I should say. C- a couple things I think that are worth considering here. So, not only has he been good, but let's talk a little bit about Brandon Marsh. And I want to be fair here. He had a couple decent swings yesterday. I thought he ran into some bad luck. Yeah. I think he's actually. I can't put numbers behind this to say it, but I do feel like that he's hit a lot of balls to the warning track over the last couple of weeks. There's been some, some element of bad luck, I think to these numbers, but that being said, like you go back to May 1st, here's Brandon Marsh since May 1st, 141 plate appearances, 121 at bats. He's hitting 198 with a 534 OPS since May 1st. He has a 286 on-base percentage. He's slugging 248. He has one home run since May 1st. I mean, I don't know, man. Like, I got to say, like, that's not very good. And I just think that here you go against lefties. Here he is against lefties this season. He's hitting 211 with a 648 OPS. So, I think what I want to say here is this. Brandon Marsh helped the Phillies get to the World Series last year. I think that he's a a very usable player. I think that he is a guy that you want to have on your team. I like the energy. I like a lot of what he brings. I I think he's a a fine player. But I don't know that he's a starting center fielder. I don't know that he's an everyday player. He, to me, might be a – maybe on this team, like he he can stick as an everyday player. 
but he might be a fourth outfielder. And I think that we've sort of like, and I don't want to say that to sound critical. Like I'm, I'm trying to just, this is what I see. Yeah. I think he might be a really good fourth outfielder or he might be a just playable enough center fielder that you can protect with other parts of your lineup. But I, I don't think if, if someone comes in like Christian Pache and challenges him, I do not think that there's any reason to just defer to Brandon Marsh because I don't, I don't think that there's that we're there with him at all. No, no. As, as a matter of fact, I, I wouldn't mind them kind of splitting it, you know, I mean, I think we're going to, it's going to be an eventual gradual approach to get to that. Like I wouldn't mind them, you know, three games, one guy, three games, another each week, right. Kind of thing. Like I wouldn't mind it being like a pretty even split to be fair, because I'm not like, like you said to me via text yesterday, I agree. I'm not completely convinced that Christian Pache is going to, is going to hit well enough. Um, but at the same time, like I, I'm willing to give it a shot. Right. Let's see well, how it you, out. Does it turn? I, I I understand because if if nothing else, you're at least getting that defense. Right. So well, there's really no. I don't want to say there's no downside because he could come up and absolutely kill you in a key spot, but there's enough there defensively that you can work through some offensive inconsistencies where I think it is worth at least exploring in light of the fact that I don't know what Brandon Marsh is yet. I, I thought that he was a, I, I thought when he came here, he was billed as a really good defender and they could fix some things with his swing offensively. And then he did hit for the Phillies last year enough. I think he hit more than they thought he was going to hit. Then he gets off to this crazy start this year. One of the top, five OPSs through the month of April. Everyone's like, dude, is he taking the step? Is he an all-star? I don't think that that was sustainable. He's not that player. I don't know if he's a 198 hitter though, that we've seen for the last 45 days either. Like, I don't know what he is, but he's got to produce. Like he's not the guy that has the track record. He's not the guy that we know can hit 35 home runs and has to just work his way through a slump. Like he, he's still in a prove it phase. So he's not, He's not Bryce Harper. He's not Trey Turner. He's not JT Real Muto. Guys that have gone through these like funks where you go, ah, they'll be all right. Like we don't know that with him. No, I think you're right. And and I look, I, I do think he still has very good value for this team. I I don't, I don't want to dismiss Brandon Marsh and say no. Brandon Marsh stinks. Like I'm not saying no, that. No, 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 no. Right? Neither am I. I think that there's I think that there's still real value for him with this with this team i just don't think it's as an if you want to win a championship i don't think it his value is as an everyday player i think his value is more on a on a little bit more of a limited basis kind of like what you've been saying about edmundo sosa for a while right i mean you kind of you can't, i mean we haven't even gotten into him but i mean it's gotten to the point where he he cannot be an everyday guy nah. right so i don't it's not that bad i mean i think sosa's a much worse case scenario than uh, as an everyday player than Marsh. I'd rather have Marsh in the lineup every day than Sosa. So, I mean, it's not gotten to that point. Um, but at the same time, I do think that there is a world where it can work better with him in a straight platoon with Christian Pache, even if it's, even if you're doing it very, via matchups, like, okay, this right. game, we, we, we know we're going to need a little bit more defense in this game because of the, you know, the, the who we're pitching and, or who they're, well, we, are, we have a fly ball pitcher. Let's put Pache out there. Or, you know, we're facing a tough, a tough pitchers. The runs are going to be at a premium, you know, uh, maybe we want to go a little bit more on the offensive side with Marsh in that spot, like whatever, whatever the case might be, whatever it is. But I think it's an okay situation to have. And I'd rather that, than one guy being stuck on the bench because the other guy has to play. And you're talking about two relatively young players. It's for what is the best for the 2023 Phillies to get the most out of these guys and the most out of optimizing your lineup day in, day out. Like this does not have to be a referendum on their careers. What Brandon Marsh is going to be correct. Maybe for this year, these guys work in that type of role. And then maybe Brandon Marsh turns into an everyday player. Sure. I, I have no idea, but for where they're at right now, what you're talking about, like I can buy into that. Yeah, no, I, a thousand percent, a thousand percent, and I think that that's where I look. I no one has said that's said this to me. I just, just kind of watching how things happen with around this team and paying attention. I kind of get the sense that they're getting closer to that becoming a thing, and that's why I said let's keep our eyes on it because I, well, I think we're going to get there. Pate's here, period. You know that they they went out and got him. They, yeah. Like when they did it, we're all kind of like, what? 
You know, he yeah. doesn't he doesn't hit. He can't hit. What are they doing? And they're going to roster this guy? And then they played him. And you're like, they're playing him? Yeah. Like the fact that that that, that even happened, that, that 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 they went out and got him and that they brought him in, I think that was telling just where they are sort of – how they were viewing this at the start. Yeah. And now you're getting this type of performance, and I think it really makes it a, an interesting dynamic. So – I'm with you on that. Um, and as you're talking, I can't help but think to myself, and it has become sort of the, the uh, it's a like group think at this point, but like, damn, they really, that that bat might be the priority here. Like, it really might be. Yeah. Just because there's so much uncertainty with this offense where you're like, what day of the week is it? That's going to dictate <laughs> on uh, how I, I view Alec Boehm because yeah. Alec Boehm's a breakout offensive candidate. Oh, wait, no, he's banging the ball into the ground again. It just killer rates. Oh, no, wait, he's found the gaps again. I, I have just, I have almost just given up trying to figure out what we're watching there with him. <laughs> and so you, don't, you don't know what you're getting. And like, I don't know. The, the one thing I wanted to talk about, and I don't think we're going to get into this, uh, you know, in too much depth, but. I don't know what Bryce Harper is going to be the rest of the year. Like, do, is Bryce Harper going to hit 300, but but kind of just be like that? You know, uh, I don't know if Bryce does Bryce Harper hit 15 home runs this season. He's at three right now. That's a good question. He's been playing for about. 45 I, I'll say days. I'll say yes. I still okay. think 15 is a number that's attainable. I'm not certain 20 is. I think that somewhere between 15 and 20 is 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 realistic with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I do think as the season progresses and his arm gets better, even as it goes along, I think that power stroke will will start to return. It's just a matter of when. When will the, it? Start? The great thing is that the floor is what you're seeing right now. Yeah, and you're like, well, he's hitting 300, and the, his OPS is sitting north of 800. Like, I'll I'll take that. Like, yeah. if that's the worst case scenario, sign me up for that. Yeah. But he hasn't been the devastating middle of the lineup impact. No that that we know him to be you know what he's been bob he's been a leadoff hitter (laughs) (laughs) i don't want to get into that i'm just saying that's no i know that's the kind of a bat he has okay like so again not a not a (laughs) knock on him whatsoever if this is what he is this year then so be it it's commendable that he's even out there right now all that stuff we still didn't think he'd be playing for another three weeks you know back in march right so Please, like you know, I'm sure someone at the Phillies is like, are they are they knocking Bryce? No, no. <laughs> but no. I don't know. I don't know for sure that he's going to be Bryce Harper, you know, this year. So then you don't know about the inconsistencies of Alec Bohm, where for three weeks he looks like one of the best hitters in baseball, and then he looks like one of the worst. Bryson Stott, I think I know what he is at this point, but again, there's a little bit of up and down there. Center field is a question mark. I, I think for me, I, I can't have Imundo Sosa playing all the time. I don't think you can rely on Cody Clemens to produce to the level that he has. I think you need another bat in this, in this lineup. If, if like th- to me, it's like win a championship. So, can the Phillies win eighty-seven games and be the second wild card team as currently constructed? Yeah, yeah. Maybe, yeah. but if if we want to push this into a championship conversation, I think they they need some. And I've been saying this for for months. It's not new. But they need somebody that you put in the middle of that lineup and say, "Wow, look at look at the impact! Not only that he brings in terms of his own numbers, but look at how it just changes the the length and the feel and just the overall approach of this lineup. They need that piece." Yeah, let's let's save the the Paul Goldschmidt conversation for Friday, and I say that because I want to see what the Cardinals do this week. Yeah, because if the Cardinals continue to plummet, I mean, they did win two out of three against the Mets. And they are in a bad division, but if they continue to struggle this week, and they're you know, they're I think they have ten- Washington this week. Yeah, you know you're make me look it up. No, I think yeah. I, I think you're right. I think I saw yeah. the same. I think I, think I, I remember saw- looking like and, and saying uh, this morning, if if the Cardinals are going to get back into it, they're going to have to do it now. Like yeah, they have to. Right, you're right. That's what the thing is. It has to happen now. So so let's see what where the Cardinals are come the end of the week. They play. Um, they play three in Washington and then weirdly, weirdly have two days off Thursday and Friday and only play two games Saturday and Sunday against the Cubs. Hmm. That's a weird thing. Like, why would they have two days off in a yeah. row? Uh, that's strange. Like pre-scheduled. That's weird. That's weird. Um, unless one of the, unless something got moved, maybe the wash one of the Washington games got moved. 
maybe they were supposed to have an off day today and for some reason they had to move one. I don't know. I, I would have to look into right. why that is. But it's so but then they go then they go Astros, Yankees right after that, and then Marlins. So I mean they got a tough they got a tough road ahead. Yeah. Um, you know, let's see where they are. Can they get themselves back into it against Washington and the Cubs? If they can't, then we'll start talking about Paul Goldschmidt. Yeah. Because I, you know, what will it cost to get a guy like that? And if if it's what I think it is. I probably still wouldn't do it, but if it's a little bit less than that, yeah, then I'm, then you can convince me. Then you can convince me. So let's save it for that. All right, hit me with one last thing and let's wrap this up. So, Bob, I want to do one last thing today. I want to do a little bit of positivity, but then end it on a negative. Not about the not about the Phillies, but a negative baseball note. Um, and I and I hope it ends up becoming bad karma. So obviously, yesterday was Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. Um, uh, hopefully uh, you had a great day on Father's Day. Uh, I did. It was awesome. I had a great Father's Day. Um, and there was a couple of things yesterday that that uh, both uh, the Phillies and Major League Baseball put out that really kind of like was awesome. And that was, first of all, the Phillies doing that thing with Liam Castellanos. Did you see that video? Yeah, we, put, yeah, we put it up. Yeah. It was really great. First of all, that kid is it, it, the fact that he speaks so well at nine Pretty years impressive old. Pretty impressive kid, yeah. Is a, he's yeah. really impressive, really impressive. So, like that was that was like a really cool video. I was like, this is awesome uh, for Father's Day, having him mic'd up and talking about his dad and saying Happy Father's Day. And then uh, ESPN, to their credit, um, they put out an old uh, E60 uh, thing that they did on Rich Donnelly. Um, I don't know if you remember who he was. He was a third base coach for the Pirates and the Marlins in the '90s. Uh, he was one of like Jim Leland's best friends, and um, the whole story about his daughter who she died of brain cancer. Um, but there was like this family motto with the chicken runs at midnight. You, you know this story? The chicken runs at midnight. Check out the E60 called the Chicken Runs at Midnight. I, I don't want to give it away here. I'm going to tell everybody to watch it. It's only 10 minutes. It's one. Of, it's not like a long E60. It's a 10-minute E60. But ESPN has it up. They put it up yesterday. Uh, they did it a few years ago. They filmed it a few years ago. It's it, it's not current. Um, but it would they re-put it up there again. And it's just another one of those great father ch- father child moments. Awesome, awesome. And baseball has that, right, Bob? That that real family kind of feel to it there's a lot of familial stories with baseball that really are so so cool and then there's what the atlanta braves did yesterday the atlanta braves had planned for charlie culberson's dad to throw out the first pitch at home on father's day okay had got him flew him into the flew him into the game okay got him a ticket to the game he was going to walk out onto the field, throw the first pitch to his son. Now, Charlie Culberson has been kind of an, a you know a quad A kind of player for a long time, but really popular in Atlanta. They re-signed and recalled him in uh, in May. hasn't played. He's basically been the twenty sixth guy on their roster for the for a month and just not never got even got into a game. He's just kind of been there. Dad's about to throw the first pitch out, and then they announced before the game that they DFA'd the kid. <laughs> And they had yeah. a switch, and Michael Harris's dad steps in, and you know he throws out the first pitch to his son. Michael Harris goes five for five, so that's kind of a good story for you know Michael Harris. But how, how do you do that to Charlie Culberson and his dad? You can't wait a day. You can't wait a day to DFA Charlie Culberson when you've had this planned, and it's all, and everybody knows, and he's such a popular figure in Atlanta. Like you can't wait one day i hope that bad karma comes back on the atlanta braves for something the phillies would never do that well yeah i mean never do that in the braves defense they had to optimize the roster to complete a four-game sweep of the colorado rockies (laughs) (laughs) like there was nobody was like even kind of like like the phillies nick cassiano sat yesterday with a, a stomach bug for a second straight day, they sat Bryce Harper. They're like, we're in Oakland. Like, it's been yeah. a long week. You know, we got a day off tomorrow. Why don't we, like, we're just going to, we're going to pump the brakes here. We think we can handle it. Braves say, no. <laughs> get, get Culberson out of here. Tell his dad to scram. We got, we're going for broke against the Rockies today. We don't make this move. We might not beat them. Come on. No, now. I, I agree. Actually, I, I, 
I, mean, I kind of agree with you on this. I mean, come on. It's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. the, the, your, your point about the Phillies is great. When you really think about it, and let, let's be honest, yesterday's game, they literally had one bench player. I mean, because you got to assume Stubbs can't, you know, he's the emergency catcher, so you can't you can't put him into a game and then Real Muto gets hurt and then you don't have a catcher, right? So you had Cody Clemens as the only option. Mm-hmm. And Harper wasn't even, I mean, he was sitting there and not even in uniform. Yeah, like Bryce Harper was not playing yesterday. He was not swinging yesterday. And you couldn't, with, with Schwarber DHing, even if you pinch hit for Harper, then you have to use somebody else to sub because Harper can't play the field, right? right? So, so there's that whole thing. And then Castellanos is down with the stomach illness. And, you know, when you're down three bullpen pitchers, they basically played against the A's with 21 guys yesterday. You mean the Braves couldn't do that for one day on Father's Day with the with the dad there? Yeah. I mean, come let on. him have his moment, like as a send off. Like, yeah, you even call him that morning and say, hey, after the game today, we're we got to yeah. make this move. But we're going to, you know, we want you to have this moment. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. In front of the fans and, you know, everybody loves it. I don't know. To me, that is that is so bad karma thing. I'm like, and I hope it I hope it burns the Braves at some point. All right. Well, thanks for tuning in to Cross Club. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm <Michael. laughs> uh, for Anthony Sia Filippo, I'm Bob Wankel. You can follow us on Twitter at Up Phillies show account at Anthony Philly at Pop Michael C B. If you want to follow us, I, I don't know why you would, but if you want to, and then you can uh, make sure that you're checking us out on YouTube, Spotify, anywhere that you get your uh, podcasts and shows. And did uh, I t- did I tell you I had Amazon uh, had Alexa play us on the? Oh uh, yeah, the- you could ask yeah. Alexa to play "Crossed Up" a Phillies yeah. podcast. Okay, yeah. you can even ask Alexa, and you can listen to us right in your kitchen. Um, so we will be back on Friday. Phillies Braves this week, massive series. It's a must win. Gotta have it. It's a it's a referendum on the 2023 Phillies. I say that now, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, We will talk soon, and uh, thanks for tuning in, everybody.